some LaTeX issues that have come up for a number of different people are things like this. Um, let's see. Everybody see this? Yes. Yeah. Thank you all for your responses. So I'm not blaming anybody for these sort of mistakes. Uh, they're not even really mistakes. You got the uh, output you might have wanted. I'm just going to help us refine our LaTeXing, if you are willing to make it a verb, as we go through the semester. And so one that came up a lot in Friday's office hours was this sort of thing. It's best to keep your math all math and keep your English all English, but finding that line to balance where math is math and where English is English takes some time and takes some practice especially as you start developing your LaTeX skills. So here's my first recommendation. I'll have a second recommendation after this, but I just wanna ask, are there any questions on this? Sounds like no. So if you were making any kind of, um, if you were typing out your math like this at all in your course notes, I encourage you to move these dollar signs out basically as far as you can for any of your math stuff. And that might take you going back into your course notes and modifying some things you already have in there. But that is the intent of what I want these course notes to be. Um, I want them to be, uh, how you say, a living document, maybe. As the semester progresses, when you learn new things that refine your understanding of previous concepts, I want you to go back and met, uh, modify these. So let's get another example going of some issues that came up. So... This syntax is the way you get these curly braces to define the sets inside some sort of math uh, environment, whether that's inline LaTeX code or display mode LaTeX code. You need to backslash these curly braces because otherwise LaTeX doesn't know the context of the curly braces. If you don't put the backslashes here to define a set using the curly braces, it doesn't know whether or not the curly braces are used in this context relative to math BB or are used in this context relative to a set. That is all about the user intent. And unfortunately, computers are not terribly smart. And so they can't figure out that difference very easily. Okay, any questions on this one? Looks good. So for that one, you would put the math blackboard command in with the N and then put the slashes in front of the curly braces? When you're using math BB, there are no backslashes in front of the curly braces. The backslash okay. goes in front of math BB. Okay. Cool, thanks. Okay, good. And one more, which I just posted to Piazza this morning because I didn't have time to get to it any sooner on uh, over the weekend. Was oh, I just I just figured I just answered my own question. I'm sorry, Professor, to interrupt, but it was the end was actually the argument of Math BB in that case. Correct. Got uh, it. Christian, okay. it sounds like you're a computer science major. A little bit of everything, but uh, also a little bit of LaTeX. So I'm a mathematician as well. <laughs> Uh, right, sounds good. I'm trying to limit my like over the top computer science lingo because not all of us are computer science. Right. What I was doing as I was comparing the line that had the set notation to the line that had where you intended to have NB black 
black uh, blackboarded. Yeah. And I didn't realize that in the first case, it was a set. And in the second case, it was just defining a blackboarded letter. And it was not intended to be a set from the beginning. So I, I got Solid. it. Thank you. Good. I'm glad you figured it out. And the technicality on the difference between the curly braces and different contexts is saying the curly braces are overloaded as uh, the defining arguments on a function, on the symbols that define the arguments on a function, like mathbb, and for the context of sets. Thank so you. those curly braces are overloaded. OK, there was one more that came up. And it goes like this. You can get that syntax for, um, here, let's draw it out first. You can get this syntax with the following. OK, so cap is this symbol for intersection. Underscore and then the curly braces are saying put everything within the curly braces as a subscript. And so it'll put all of the i equals 1 below. Carrot is shift six, and then a letter that you want in the superscript. Now, if you wanted to put an entire expression in a superscript, you could use curly braces here, just like we did for the subscript. But I don't have that in this case, so I'm showing you both scenarios in one line of LaTeX. And then your set AI. An alternative symbol is big cap, which will get you a bigger intersection symbol. And that's more appropriate for display mode math. If you're trying to take your math and like center it and then put some spacing, vertical and uh, vertical spacing above and below that line of LaTeX. OK, those were my comments on LaTeX from last week's office hours, at least the ones that came up uh, repeatedly. OK, good talk. I will um, try to do a bit better of a job of explaining LaTeX in my YouTube videos as I go. I always intend to do that, but I haven't been very good about it. So I will try to do a little bit better as I go. And until then, we're going to continue our discussion about functions and sets. You see, I've swipped it, uh, flipped it this time, because this week we're going to start out with functions and then end with how our newly acquired knowledge of functions uh, applies to sets. And so this is really just kind of me finishing up the last of last week's lecture, where we kind of trailed off really quickly in the last 10 to five to 10 minutes where I tried cramming in functions, the definition of one to one, and then the size of sets. So I'm just going to do that a little bit more slowly right now so that we all have a good understanding of notation that I am going to prefer in this class for functions. And it's going to go like this. Say you have a function named f. We're going to make believe that f is a map that takes you from one set S to another set T. And this is the notation we're going to use to say that F specifically takes you from the set S into the set T. Now we might draw that where S is just this circle and T is just this circle. And it takes you from points, maybe named X, not very cleverly, to f of x. And this is what the function f does. Now, this jives pretty closely with the way you think about functions already, which I imagine is going to be something closer to this. So let's just give an example of like x squared, and we'll say f of x equals x squared. And we think of x down here, and it's going to look something like this. 
Uh, you're gonna have to cut me some slack on my drawing on a computer because uh, I'll tell you what, I could draw X squared on a chalkboard, perfect. But here, eh, not as good. Anyway, thanks. So the way we think about it is it takes the number two to four. Not very clever, right? Does that all make sense to everyone? Yep. Yes. And one more example. Thanks, Karen. Surprise, surprise. Sounds good. Okay. This is the way I'm going to write out sets because in the world of statistics, there is you guys ready for this? A set of functions that are particularly interesting to statisticians. And these functions, this set of functions, are defined partly by the size of the domain and some properties of the codomain. So I'm just writing these little notes down here to say the general name for the uh, set from which elements are mapped is called the domain. And the set into which elements are mapped is called the codomain. There is a set of functions in the world of statistics that A, depend on the size of the domain. And that's what we're going to talk about a lot today. And then B, depend on some properties of the codomain. So we're going to be getting into a set of functions that depend on properties of the domain and the codomain. So this notation is going to be super informative for us as we go through the semester. Another thing we're going to need to know about functions is the definition of one to one. And it goes like this. Um, let's start out different. A function f is one to one, or sometimes people use the word injective. A function is injective. If every unique element of the domain is mapped to a unique element of the codomain. So let's just give some quick examples. Of one to one functions. So this isn't going to be any kind of proof. But I think it will help you get the idea. And I'll just keep with the same notation for our sets for the codomain in the domain. So if we have a function that maps like this, then we call that function one to one. Let me give us a quick similar sort of picture about a not one to one function. Do you see in the not one-to-one -one function, there are unique elements in the domain that are not mapped to unique elements in the codomain? Yeah, Edward, we see that. Great picture. Thanks, yeah. all. So, so the, um, the, the example from before would be not injective, right? The x squared? Correct. And so that's exactly numbers. what 
we're going to go back to. So here is an example of a knot. One to one. Can someone else, I believe that was Kieran who last spoke, someone else explain to us why x squared is not one to one? So you can do negative negative two also goes to four. Sounds good. Are there other numbers that might also go to non-unique elements? It's basically just flipped on the, the whole entire the... side. Oh. Nice. OK, so you all are picking this up pretty well? Yep. Yep. Great. Fantastic. OK, next I want to define cardinality of a set. The cardinality of a set is a count of the number of elements in that set. So if we gave an example, one, two, three, four, then A has cardinality four. four. Thank you. And we'd write it like this. It's almost like you take the absolute value of a set. Does everyone know where to find the pipe operator on their keyboard? It's above enter. Solid. Uh, Joseph, pipe indeed, just like you say, is above enter. You've got to hold shift as well. So in fact, all of you have figured out where uh, backslash is on your keyboard. So all you got to do is hold shift backslash. And that will get you pipe. You put one before and one after the set you're trying to specify the cardinality of. OK, here we go. We're finally making it somewhere. We finally have all the component pieces we need to get to a good point that will help us define this set of interesting functions to statisticians. One of the properties we're going to need for these uh, interesting functions in the world of statistics is countable sets. So we're going to need to know whether or not our set is crazy big or just you know, generally pretty big. And that's my loose way of saying, look, the natural numbers n are an infinite set. But there exists sets of bigger infinities. Is that not the craziest thing you've heard on this Monday? The natural numbers n is an infinite set. But it's a relatively small infinite. So we call it countable. 
other sets that are similarly small are countable. But there exist sets that are so much bigger, they are not countable. And unfortunately for the world of math, Um, Unfortunately for math, definitions like this tend to happen. You first define a thing, and then you define another thing by saying it's not that first thing. <laughs> it's really quite obnoxious, but that's the way it goes. OK, let's do some quick examples. Um, yeah, okay. Let's just pick out the positive even numbers. Do we all agree that the positive even numbers just kind of go on forever? Yes. Yep. They tend to infinity as well. So this would be a countable set. And there you have it. The function 2x is all you need. Uh, I guess I missed zero. For those of you that want to be incredibly particular, include zero in this or not. I don't care. It doesn't really matter, because if you just add one, it's not like you're doing much to this set. Does this example uh, seem to jive with everyone? Here's my next example. R is an uncountable set. The real numbers are an infinitely large set, so much so that there is no way to find a one-to-one -one function between the set of real numbers and the natural numbers. Now, there's formal proofs to this, but I'm going to give you just a flavor, just a general understanding of how the proof might look. And then I'm going to skip all the details, because this class does not need to get into the nitty gritty of um, proofs about the size, about the cardinality of sets. Consider just the interval 0 to 1, which is obviously a subset of the real numbers. So I'm going to do a quick little table to show you that there's no reasonable one-to-one -one function from even just the interval 0 to 1 to the natural numbers. So let's say we're going to start with 0 to 1, and we're going to look at how that maps into the natural numbers. So 0 to 0 sounds like a good mapping. 
And then let's say 0 0.1. OK, let's map that to 1. Indeed, Hayes, this one gets crazy. And then how about 0, 0, 001? And OK, I'm kind of already running out of numbers in my head. Let's map that to 2. Let's go 0, 0, 0, 001. I guess I'm going to have to map that to 3. Let's go point zero 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 one. I guess I'm going to have to map that to four. OK, am I ever able to stop adding decimal places? No. No. So can I exhaust all the natural numbers just by continually incrementing the decimal places? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Have I gotten anywhere? relative to the uh, range of this interval? No. No. I haven't even gotten to like 0.2 or 0 0.002, 0 0.0002, 0 0.0002, let alone all the other numbers in this interval. And that itself is quite a small interval in the whole real numbers. So you can see I can exhaust the entire set of natural numbers just with a fraction of the uh, interval 0 to 1 of real numbers, let alone anything beyond the interval from 0 to 1 in the real numbers. Yeah, Jose, I totally get it. The first time you see this, it is crazy to think about that there's A, sizes of infinity, and B, Here's two quick examples that just get thrown at, you know, anybody studying math so fast in this world. Okay, I'm going to pause here for just a second. Are there any questions? Correct, Jake. Most linear functions are wait are countable. We can't say uh, linear functions are countable because countable applies to sets. But you could say most linear functions are one to one. Does that work for you? As long as they're odd. If they're even, then you might knock out half the, the codomain. As long as what's odd? Like an x squared example from the first slide, um, the input is all the natural numbers, actually all the reals. But if you if you uh, limit it to the natural numbers, the domain the domain is natural. The out the uh, codomain is only half of the the domain. So I think, Christian, what you're doing is saying there exist other functions that are one-to-one, -one, but you're not making a general statement on linear functions. Right. Did I interpret that correctly? Yeah. Great. OK, all. Give me just a second. I have a bunch of. Last question, like you have one more question. Can a set be defined by a function? Yes. You can use set builder notation to define a set by a function. And at least that's the first way I thought of how to interpret that question? And the answer is absolutely. Can a set be defined by a function? Sure. I'm going to say I want the set of all x's such that f of x is equal to 0. And you just pick your function f. 
So like, okay, how about a better example? I will pick a specific value for the function f. Okay, great question. Are there other follow-up questions before I give some uh, general examples of this new function notation? Okay, it doesn't look like it. Here we go. Um, Hayes, uh, sine x is not a one-to-one -one function, but it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one function in order to use a function to define a set. It just might mean that your set is countable or uncountable. Is that okay? Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, since we're talking about it, the function sine might be written like this. Sine is a function that can go from any real number, and it takes you into the interval negative one to one. We all agree with this? Yes. Fantastic. Let's do another one. Arc sine is a really annoying beast because it takes you from the interval one to one, negative one to one into negative pi over two to pi over two. So it does indeed apply the inverse of sine and yet does not get you back to R. Okay, that's incredibly obnoxious. Thank you, that was my favorite example I could come up with. Okay, I'm going to see if we can completely use this new notation to understand a new function. Let A be a set uh, in the real numbers. Whoops, I'm going to define the function named one subscript A. That is the name of my function. Takes you from the natural numbers to the set of zero to one. One A of X is equal to one if X is in A and zero if X is not in A. What do you all think about that? Oh, sorry. Wait, wait, sorry. Uh, everybody waited and then responded at the same time. <laughs> okay, one at a time, but please do let me know what you think. So you pretty much you you turned a set into now a binary notation, right? Yeah, right. We're essentially turning this into a binary function. Which will be useful in statistics, I would imagine. Which is gonna be super useful in the world of statistics. Right, at this point, this class is still just kind of building up sets of tools that we're gonna use throughout the rest of the semester. AJ, did you have a comment too? Oh, no, I was just uh, marinating on this still. OK. We got a question in the chat about how to do this in LaTeX. This one's not too bad. You could just use one. I'll give you some options if you want to do fancy um, ones later on. So one underscore A 
left parenthesis, right parenthesis. Uh, left parenthesis, X, right parenthesis. Oh, doing the piecewise functions in LaTeX. Ah, Brendan, I didn't read your uh, question completely. To be honest, I look up how to do piecewise functions in LaTeX every time. I have yet to memorize it. So how about this as a compromise? If you find it before I find it later on today, will you post it to Piazza? And if I find it before you find it, I'll post it to Piazza. Great, thanks so much for the compromise. Okay, the last 12 minutes of this class or however much time I take to do this is going to preface what's gonna happen for the rest of this week in videos, okay? The world of statistics, statistics uses these mathematical things and we'll define it later much better than I'm going to now called distributions. And so this week, I'm going to introduce you to a number of named distributions. Distributions serve two roles for us in the world of statistics. The first role they serve is um, random number producers. That is, these distributions produce random numbers for us. So when we think of a process out there in the real world, and process means a hundred different things to each one of us, so let me be a little bit more clear. When we think of a process out in the real world that we can collect data from, statisticians tend to believe that there is a distribution abstractly defined that is generating those numbers, those data. So to me, a process is literally anything that produces data. That could be like your parents got together, they produced you, you grew up to be some height. So your height is data as far as a statistician is concerned. Because that happened for each of us, there is a process out there that is people get together, they have children, those children grow up to be some adult height. And that adult height is numbers, theoretically random, because I don't know how tall any of us is that came from some distribution in the world of statistics. Now, whether or not there is a mathematical distribution that produced those numbers does not matter to statisticians. They assume these distributions are what are producing the numbers. Okay, it's a little weird of a concept to just go ahead and assume that this math mathematical thing is producing these numbers, but uh, you're all having to take this class because statistics is uh, incredibly popular these days. And so you can trust that this assumption that distributions are producing these numbers is at least reasonable. It may not be perfect. It may not be excellent, but it's not unreasonable. Okay. The second thing to know about distributions is the numbers show up in patterns. The patterns are dictated by, not a great choice of word, Let me be a little bit more clear. Probability density functions. Professor, are we going to talk about where in this process people sometimes manipulate to make to cause the outcome to be the way they want it to be in statistics? 
Uh, we can, but that won't happen this week. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, I can get back to that later on throughout the semester, though. To kind of see a pattern or a fingerprint so that we can identify situations where the stats might have been shifted or manipulated in some way. Sure. It's um, an incredibly difficult task to do, but yeah, we can talk about it. Like okay. to be successful in identifying when people have done this. Right. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Okay. So this week, I'm going to start our journey through the world of distributions. And I'm going to do this by showing you examples in R of some of the more popular named distributions. Now I go through there and generally the first thing I try to do is give you an example of what this distribution is supposed to represent. And then I try to generate some fake data for you on a computer. Okay. At various times in the lectures, it doesn't always happen immediately. I'll then try to create for you a plot. And the idea is like this. These uh, density functions is often what people call them for short, instead of including the word probability. Probability is just kind of assumed known show up something like this. And now I'm just completely making up an example, just because I want us to understand where we're going to go this next uh, week in course material. On the x-axis are values that your random data could theoretically take on. On the y-axis, is not probability, but you all are going to think of it as probability for a while. I don't care if you, it helps you to think of the y-axis as probability for a little bit longer, but eventually we're going to have to work our way away from that. The y-axis is something analogous to probability in that the higher the number, the more likely this value is to show up in your data. The higher the number, the more likely this value is to show up in your data. The lower the number, density here, the lower the number, the less likely it is for those numbers to show up in your randomly produced data from said distribution. Okay. The other thing you're going to want to do is to think that the density function is the distribution but that is also not the case. So we're gonna make some notes as we go. Density, not equal to probability. Density function, let me write that a little bit better. Not equal to the distribution, but both are closely related. OK. So from here, I'm going to go to the syllabus. And y'all are still following along here. You can see me scrolling through the syllabus. Yes. Great, thank you. Both of these books will contain more information on density functions than I'm giving you this week. If you want to go read in either of these about density functions, I encourage you to follow along for the specific names that I'm going to give you for the distributions of interest. So for instance, Distributions show up in chapter two. Oops, sorry. Better, yes. Distributions show up in chapter two of this book. And there are a ton of them. So if you just scroll down, you will eventually find 
a bunch of discussions we haven't talked about yet. That's okay. For instance, the Bernoulli distribution is gonna show up almost immediately for us in our lecture videos. But you can see it takes a little bit to show up in the book. Now I'm doing this by intent. It's my opinion that for non-statistics, even for statistics majors, there's a lot of context in the world of statistics that is lost in textbooks like this. So this week, I'm trying to provide you the context that I think will help you understand when we get to notation that looks like this. It's going to take us a little bit to get to notation like this. But if you want to dive in, you see how easy it was to find some named distributions in our textbook. It's similarly easy to find named distributions in the other textbook. They exist in all the stats textbooks. But this week, I'm hoping to provide you some general context that will help us better understand what the hell these people are talking about when they write notation like this. So I'm kind of tiptoeing for another week before we get to more, some more serious notation. Okay, that's all I have to say for the day. We're two minutes early on um, time. So hopefully you can stick around and ask questions if you want. And if you don't, by all means, I will post the lecture videos. I'm gonna try to get to them before the next section, but to be honest, I'm not optimistic I'll have it done. I think I will have all of the lecture videos posted um, sometime after the next section at three o'clock, but they will be posted by the end of Monday today. Thanks all for your Thank time. You so Thank, Thank you. you so much, Professor. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, so everyone. For the R tutorials, so we should just put that in our course notes by putting some like R code blocks in. Totally. Or... You want to see a quick go of that? Yeah. So um, here are some of the examples I came up with for your course notes. <laughs> uh, I mean, for the lecture videos later on. So let me just create a new R Markdown document. It doesn't matter what it's named. Here's a quick example. I'll just delete this R code chunk. So to include an R code chunk into your course notes, go up here to insert and insert an R code chunk. And then anything you include in there will show up in the knitted output. Both the code and its output will show up. All right, it's cool. So we don't have to worry about, okay, yeah, yeah, so it'll show. All right, good. Yeah, you have to go out of your way to hide it, but I don't want you to hide it because I wanna see that you all know how to code. It won't show like the global environment with the variables and everything, but I guess that's okay though. Oh, no, that's an excellent lesson to learn as soon as we can this semester. The global environment of our studio and your R Markdown document are separate environments. They have no relation. That's going to come back to haunt you multiple times this semester, Karen. I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to stop Thank recording you. now.